Um, so again, if you, if you have questions or you want to email me, that's my email address. Um, and again, all the slides and things are on uh, that website. So we are going to change um, from hyper and talk about hypo and dogs. We'll talk about cat adrenal stuff uh, tomorrow, where it's mainly hyperaldosteronism that we'll be talking about. So Addison's and the dog is a, an interesting disease because we can go back into uh, the late 1800s when uh, Dr. Brown Sicard was doing studies on dogs, and one of the things he was interested in was the effects of adrenalectomy. And again, you know, this is back in the day when people didn't really know what any of these organs did, and so they would periodically go in and do studies and remove an organ and see what effect there was. And so Brown Sicard figured out you could take out one adrenal, uh, from a dog and nothing happened, but you took out two adrenals from a dog and they would start to feel pretty cruddy within about a day or two and then they would be dead pretty much within a week. And he started developing the brown Sicard extract where he would take dried up adrenal gland and give it to dogs um, after they'd been adrenalectomized and found out uh, that did not work. Um, and then he would grind up the adrenal gland and inject it, uh, reconstitute it and injected intravenously, and, and that pretty much didn't work. So all he knew is that the adrenal glands produced something that was vital uh, to life. So what we know about the adrenal glands is that, you know, there's two of them, and that basically they serve multiple functions uh, in the body uh, depending on what part of the uh, adrenal is being utilized. And the adrenal gland from an embryology standpoint is really a combination of epithelial cells and neural tissue. So the adrenal medulla, which is primarily responsible for catecholamines, is basically nervous tissue and epithelial tissue migrates uh, and surrounds it so that we end up with a, a gland that has both uh, epithelial secretory properties as well as neurologic uh, neurotransmitter properties. Um, it's responsible for producing a lot of different hormones, the catecholamines, uh, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and then sex steroids like estrogen and testosterone, although it's not the major source of production of those, the major source obviously being the ovary and the testes. But the main products that we're interested in, brown Sicard found that was resulting in clinical signs and death was the lack of cortisol uh, and the lack of aldosterone. Again, for those of you who are here for the Cushing's talk, this is you know, the major pathway of adrenal steroid genesis uh, in the dog. And again, the dog takes cholesterol out of the blood, stores it, uh, it's a very fat-soluble organ, stores the cholesterol, and then depending on the need and what the stimulus is, whether it's a change in sodium, a change in potassium, a change in blood pressure, release of ACTH from the pituitary, will funnel down each of these pathways preferentially. So either lead to the synthesis of aldosterone, lead to the synthesis of cortisol, or in cases where there's aberrant uh, enzyme production result in the overproduction of both estrogen and testosterone. The, and probably in school, you all memorize the same sort of thing, uh, the cascade uh, in the adrenal cortex. I don't know why it keeps wanting to do this. It's super annoying. By the way, the pregnant lady, where is she? It's not good. Maybe she just said Addison's was no good. Hopefully she's not downstairs somewhere screaming. You remember the outer zones, the inner to the outer zones by measuring GFR. Uh, so we have the outer zone, the glomerulosa, which is primarily involved in the synthesis of aldosterone. And for those of you who probably um, are endocrine geeks like myself are quite aware of the 50th anniversary of the discovery of aldosterone, probably attended the party. Yes? Seriously? What is wrong here? Uh, it was a great time. Uh, all seven of us really enjoyed the event. And... And then the inner zones, the fasciculata and the reticularis, which are primarily responsible for the secretion of cortisol, which is the thing that we're most interested in with respect to a typical hypoadrenocorticism uh, and obviously with Cushing's disease. And di different diseases and different medications have preferential effects on each of those different zones, uh, primarily due to the concentration of receptors uh, that are present in each of those zones. The inner reticularis, uh, the intersection is primarily responsible for synthesis of sex steroids. And I think what you'll notice is that when you look at the adrenal enzyme pathway, a lot of the drugs like trilostane or lysodrine that have adrenolytic or adrenal inhibitory effects basically start in and move out. So it'll inhibit sex steroids first and then aldosterone and cortisol uh, as it's moving through. 
we recognize Addison's disease sort of as one classic condition where there's both glucocorticoid and mineralocorticoid insufficiency. But in fact, there is multiple uh, disease states that occur both in dogs and cats and in humans where you can have complete adrenal failure. You can have just decreased synthesis of cortisol. You can have just decreased synthesis of aldosterone. Or you can have hypersecretion of any or all three. So we don't really recognize many of the disorders that occur in people, primarily because we don't see a lot of the phenotypic expression of a lot of the adrenal enzyme deficiencies uh, that happen in humans. We're primarily interested, again, in, in the regions of the adrenal that secrete glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids, the fascicula and reticularis for the glucocorticoids. We see hypofunction associated uh, with these particular zones, primarily with the classic disease, Addison's disease. And it's very interesting because if you go back again in the history of, of medicine, uh, Addison, Parkinson, and Hodgkin all did their residencies together. Uh, at the same hospital. So Hodgkin went on to discover Hodgkin's disease. Parkinson clearly discovered um, Parkinson's. And then Addison, by sheer accident, discovered Addison's disease. He was never really very happy that they named the disease Addison's because that really wasn't his interest. His interest really wasn't adrenal disease. Uh, but we can see dysfunction with Addison's. We can see dysfunction of glucocorticoid-producing cells and iatrogenically induced uh, glucocorticoid excess. So iatrogenic Cushing's basically results in adrenal hypofunction uh, because of adrenal atrophy. The drugs we use, like lysodrine, trilostane, ketoconazole, metiropone, all work to somehow block or destroy the cells that are producing glucocorticoids. And then, as we'll talk about, there is this syndrome of atypical hypoadrenocorticism or glucocorticoid insufficiency occurring in the absence of aldosterone disease. Uh, and we'll talk about the dogs that tend to get that versus the dogs that get a uh, full-blown classic Addison's disease. Dysfunction of aldosterone production, clearly we can see it with Addison's. If there's a complete autoimmune destruction of all three layers of the adrenal cortex, we can see it with both, again, lysodrine and trilostane, depending on dose. Um, preferentially, we're trying to just block glucocorticoid-producing cells, but we can take out the whole adrenal. And there are syndromes of isolated aldosterone deficiency that have been described in people, um, primarily due to a lack of the final step in the synthesis of aldosterone. We suspect that we've seen this in dogs who show up with electrolyte abnormalities. We can't find another cause. They have normal ACTH stems with respect to cortisol, but they have very blunted aldosterone responses uh, to cortisol. And so I think while it can happen in dogs, uh, it's fairly uncommon. Diseases like whipworm infestation can cause what's called a pseudo Addison's, probably happening as a result of the effects of the infestation uh, suppressing uh, the secretion of aldosterone. And the adrenal medulla, with respect to Addison's disease, ends up not being affected. The autoimmune process that destroys the adrenal with, with uh, traditional Addison's in the dog does not attack the cells that are producing uh, catecholamines, again, primarily because the antigens that are in the epithelial component of the adrenal are not present in the nerve tissue uh, that basically is the adrenal medulla. So adrenal medullary function is actually normal in patients with Addison's disease. And in humans with long-standing Addison's, what they'll find is that the adrenals actually get big over time from expansion of the medullary uh, portion of the adrenal, probably because of the stress of uh, being Addisonian. Now, all of these great hormones that are being produced by the adrenal gland all have different effects, you know, why they exist in the first place. And it's the lack of those hormones that result in either the clinical signs or the biochemical abnormalities um, that we see with glucocorticoid insufficiency. And with glucocorticoid insufficiency, and the adrenal too is probably, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's pretty sure, more Nobel Prizes have gone to people who have studied the adrenal or adrenal steroid synthesis or adrenal steroids in general, probably than any other organ. So glucocorticoids, aldosterone, the discovery of Addison's, um, treatment for uh, Addison's disease, all of those things got people uh, Nobel Prizes. So glucocorticoid deficiency and isolated glucocorticoid insufficiency, where you have normal electrolytes, generally results in signs that are hard to pinpoint because lack of glucocorticoids often are very vague. So the dogs will present initially with just anorexia, some vomiting, some melana, and in fact, GI bleeding 
with atypical Addison's can be severe enough that it warrants the need for transfusion. So you can have severe enough GI blood loss with full-blown Addison's and isolated glucocorticoid insufficient Addison's that you do need to get blood. Uh, weight loss is a very common finding with Addisonian patients, both traditional Addison's and isolated glucocorticoid. And the weight loss can actually be dramatic. Um, animals can lose 10, 15, 20% of their body weight over a period of a couple of weeks. Uh, lack of glucocorticoids predisposes to hypoglycemia because glucocorticoids are one of the counter-regulatory hormones. So when we look at the incidence of low blood sugars in patients with Addison's, it'll reflect that. And it results in impaired excretion of free water, which is one of the reasons that contributes, even in glucocorticoid insufficient animals who have normal aldosterone, you can get mild lowering of serum sodium concentrations because they have retention of free water. The major thing that glucocorticoids are supposed to do is to regulate metabolism um, and act as the hormone that's responsible for the uh, stress response. So it'll regulate metabolism of glucose um, as well as protein and fat metabolism. Released in times of stress, Hans Selye won a Nobel Prize for his work on what stress does to the body in terms of uh, CRH and ACTH and how that can be uh, the end organ effects of too much or too little glucocorticoids. Normal response to stress is primarily the fr uh, flight or fr uh, fright. So species that evolved a highly protective mechanism to get away from something bad developed a very sophisticated pituitary adrenal axis. Animals that did not develop that uh, got eaten um, and therefore did not develop a very potent axis. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we think dogs and cats are much different uh, with their pituitary adrenal axis. Dogs are much more susceptible to the effects of glucocorticoids than our cats. Cats are much more resistant. Um, the way that stresses are applied to cats are much different than the stressors that are applied to dogs. So cats are sort of, for lack of a better description, walking adrenal medullas with hair. Um, they, they live to escape uh, and to fight. They really have a poor adaptive response to uh, glucocorticoids. So what we have are steroids are primarily being regulated, the stress response and the inflammatory response from CRH, from corticotropin-releasing hormone in the hypothalamus, stimulates the release of ACTH from the pituitary. That results in release of primarily cortisol in dogs or cats from the adrenal gland. And then cortisol and ACTH turn around and go back up to the higher centers to suppress further release uh, of CRH. All of this will go horribly awry uh, in the face of uh, Addison's. The other main hormone that we're primarily concerned about is aldosterone. We'll talk tomorrow about hyperaldosteronism in cats and how it, I think it is a fairly, uh, not an uncommon disease that we keep uh, misdiagnosing in cats. But aldosterone's major actions are really on the regulation of sodium and potassium. And it really is much more affected by potassium than it is by sodium. So it only takes very, very small changes in potassium to affect big releases of aldosterone. And what aldosterone will do is it'll cause increased retention of sodium uh, in the kidney. And by pulling back sodium, it will then passively pull water. So in order for the kidney to, to uh, maintain uh, neutrality, as it pulls sodium across, it's going to pull water across. It then results in enhanced excretion of both potassium and hydrogen. So that's why we end up with hyponatremia uh, and hyperkalemia uh, when you lack uh, aldosterone. And primarily where this is all happening is in the proximal renal tubule under the influence of other uh, renal uh, hormones such as uh, renin. And we'll talk about the relationship between renin and aldosterone uh, and its actions uh, with respect to Addison's. The other major determinant of aldosterone secretion besides sodium and potassium is actually angiotensin II. So remember that we have uh, renin being secreted by the kidneys in response to reduced renal blood flow or hypotension. That cleaves angiotensinogen to angiotensin I. Angiotensin I, as far as we know, has no uh, biologic activity. But when it passes through the capillary bed in the lung under the influence of ACE, it's converted to angiotensin II. And angiotensin II does lots of things, but the main thing that it does is it stimulates the adrenal glands to result in release of aldosterone. And angiotensin II is primarily being driven not by sodium or potassium, but by blood pressure. So the major thing that will stimulate uh, its release of aldosterone or stimulating uh, the adrenals to produce aldosterone is going to be hypotension.
And then plasma potassium, independent of sodium status, independent of blood pressure, has effects on aldosterone secretion, primarily via uh, increased synthesis of aldosterone, but then it relies on the release of aldosterone as a result of other concurrent things like low sodium uh, and hypotension. Plasma potassium in and of itself, again, if you correct for hypotension and the plasma uh, potassium concentration, primarily works to sensitize the cells to the other secretagogues for aldosterone release. And even though um, potassium and atrial nitroretic peptide from the heart and ACTH have some effect on aldosterone secretion, they're mainly there to help augment the effects of the other hormones. And so when we're dealing with an Addisonian patient that is either atypical or traditional Addisonian, there's lots of things that are going on trying to combat the fact that that animal is not producing adequate amounts uh, of aldosterone, trying, trying to maintain blood pressure through other mechanisms uh, than through sodium retention. Um, this is the, uh, the graph that we were talking about a little bit about, again, renin being produced in response to hypotension, the JG cells in the kidney secreting renin, angiotensinogen from the liver then being converted to angiotensin 1, um, the discovery of renin, Nobel Prize, angiotensin 1 going to angiotensin 2 through ACE, Nobel Prize, um, going on increasing sympathetic activity. That dude didn't get anything uh, for that. <laughs> Very sad. Um, the effects on tubular sodium uh, retention and potassium excretion. Uh, aldosterone, the discovery again, uh, Nobel Prize. Um, the effects of angiotensin II as a potent arterial vasoconstrictor um, is something that wasn't recognized until actually fairly recently that independent of anything else, it it's probably plays a role in moment-to-moment -moment regulation of our blood pressure. And then probably one of the weakest things that it does is it does have a positive effect on antidiuretic hormone secretion, which is what's helping with the passive retention of water, which is accompanying the tubular reabsorption of sodium. So the main hormone that's actually involved in all of that is really angiotensin II. And there are congenital defects and genetic mutations that occur in people, haven't been reported in dogs, that result in a syndrome that looks uh, completely like Addison's disease, um, all due to not having ACE. Um, so they're born with an inability to convert angiotensin one to angiotensin two. Now, why do dogs become Addisonian? We are learning a lot more about this, especially from the uh, genetic standpoint in terms of breed predispositions, and also looking at markers in the serum of anti-adrenal antibodies uh, that occur in the serum of dogs even before they become Addisonian. So, both in I shouldn't say this. Prior to the 1930s, 1920s, the most common form of Addison's in humans was tuberculosis. So the adrenal gland filters out a lot of infectious diseases. And uh, tuberculosis, systemic fungal disease, were some of the more common causes of Addison's disease in humans. Those diseases then were controlled with medications. And now the most common form of Addison's disease that occurs in people and in the dog is a primary autoimmune disease. We don't know what the triggering event is. We don't know what the primary antigen is that is being attacked. There's multiple uh, antigen antibody interactions that occur, but it results in a slowly developing, ongoing lymphocytic plasmacytic infiltrate into the adrenal cortex. And eventually, over time, the animals lose first cortisol production, then mineralocorticoid production, and present to the clinic depending on uh, how severe their deficiency is. We also know that it's an autoimmune disease because many dogs with Addison's will develop other autoimmune endocrine diseases. So there's a five to tenfold increased risk of an Addisonian dog developing either diabetes, hypothyroidism, or hypoparathyroidism uh, during the course of his life because a lot of these autoimmune endocrine disorders, the antigen is similar. Um, so it ends up attacking multiple glands. We know that in dogs, we can make them Addisonian with drugs uh, like lysodrine or trilostane. Um, as we said, TB in people, fungal disease in dogs, histoblasto has been described to cause uh, Addison's. And lymphoma in cats, uh, large cell lymphoma in cats has been uh, described to cause Addison's in cats. So you have cats that present with classic clinical signs of Addison's, electrolyte abnormalities. They respond really well to fluids, steroids, and mineral or corticoid replacement. And then a month or two later, um, they are diagnosed with disseminated lymphoma, 
those are cats that if you were to have ultrasounded them, you would have found adrenal megaly instead of adrenal atrophy at the time you uh, diagnosed their Addison's. The autoimmune disease, again, you have to lose about 85% of adrenal function before you develop clinical signs. So it's, again, a very slow uh, type of a disorder. It's estimated that in familial Addison's in people, it can take months to years before the onset of the anti-adrenal antibodies uh, and the development of either glucocorticoid um, or mineralocorticoid insufficiency. That's primary Addison's. Primary Addison's referring to the issues in your adrenal gland. Secondary Addison's refers to one step higher. Now the problem is with uh, ACTH. So either you don't have it, and that can happen in newborn dogs and puppies that have central uh, Addison's disease, a central lack of ACTH. This is primarily seen in breeds like German Shepherds, uh, where German Shepherds are born with a defect called cystic Rathke's pouch. And so instead of the pituitary forming as tissue migrates up from the oral cavity and neural tissue migrates down from the brain, what ends up happening is that nothing migrates down from the brain, oral tissue migrates up and forms a cyst. So they can be born with uh, ACTH insufficiency, in which case they're just glucocorticoid uh, deficient Addisonian dogs, but more commonly they're born with no TSH, no growth hormone, so they present to you as a dwarf. And so whenever you're working up a dog for short stature and dwarfism, we have to look at not only growth hormone function, but we have to look at thyroid function, and we need to look at anterior pituitary function. Um, it can also happen in dogs that are given massive and prolonged doses of glucocorticoids for autoimmune diseases. And when you try and wean those patients off of the glucocorticoid, they don't, they don't do very well. Uh, and that's because if we keep ACTH levels suppressed for months and months and months, it may never come back. And so they can become uh, permanently dependent upon a glucocorticoid. Their uh, aldosterone levels are normal when the pituitary is affected, and so they always have normal electrolytes. So these animals that we diagnose with atypical or isolated glucocorticoid insufficiency only need to be given glucocorticoid replacement. They don't need to be given um, fluorin F or DOCP. Now, diagnosing Addison's is based on two things. I mean, and, and the hardest thing is the suspicion of Addison's. I think all of us, we see this in our hospital all the time, see the patients coming in, don't really recognize the, or think about the possibility of Addison's maybe on the first exam, but when they keep coming back in or they develop subsequent electrolyte abnormalities over time, somebody goes, holy crap, maybe it's Addisonian. And especially in cats, when we talk about cats, we'll, we'll talk about, I think, that that's a disease where we just don't think uh, to look for it because we just don't associate the cat with adrenal hypo function. So certainly the presence of clinical signs, certain laboratory tests that come back on screening uh, CBC, CHEM, and UA, and then looking at adrenal function testing. This is why Addison's is so hard to diagnose in, in animals, especially the glucocorticoid deficient ones, uh, and especially in uh, small breed dogs and in cats because vomiting, anorexia, weakness, I mean, that's every freaking cat uh, that comes into the clinic. So they're all Addisonian by definition. You should be stimming every cat. It's good for revenue. Send them to Antec, very helpful. Uh, we would appreciate that. Those symptoms tend to wax and wane as well. So the cat or dog feels bad for a day or two, and then they feel okay, or they come into the clinic. We don't really see much. We give them some sub-Q fluids, and then they feel better. And then they go home, and then a week later, they're back. And so whenever you have an animal where things are unexplained and things keep coming and going um, and you don't really have an answer, I always love to tell people Addison's because it gives me something to do and I get at least one or two days to think about it. Um, and the good thing about most diseases is they either go away or they progress. So we don't usually miss things. Um, it just takes longer to get there. If we look at their lab work findings of dogs anyway with Addison's, and this is a compilation of about five different studies um, looking at the percent of animals with specific abnormalities, anemia is present anywhere from 6 to 25%. And the anemia is typically mild. It's typically normocytic, normochromic. It's typically non-regenerative. And it usually is just reflecting anemia of chronic disease. It probably has to do with the effects of um, lack of glucocorticoids on stimulating erythropoiesis. 
However, like I mentioned earlier, you can have animals who present with really significant uh, GI bleeding, again, to the point of transfusion. And those dogs are really hard to diagnose with the Addison's in the beginning because they're losing so much fluid and blood through their GI tract that oftentimes their electrolytes are not abnormal. And it's only later when you put them on fluids and stabilize them and transfuse them that as they're in the hospital, they develop hyperkalemia and hyponatremia. Azotemia is probably the number one reason why animals get misdiagnosed initially uh, with Addison's because they get diagnosed with renal failure. So the problem with Addisonian dogs is they don't have aldosterone, they get volume depleted, they're hypotensive. They go from being simply dehydrated to having a pre-renal azotemia to having a full-blown renal azotemia. And also remember that dogs with Addison's, because they're lacking aldosterone and have an issue with glucocorticoids, they cannot concentrate their urine. So you're there, if they're azotemic, they're going to have dilute urine, and by definition, we diagnose that as renal failure. The thing to keep in the back of your mind with azotemic dogs is that if they have rapidly responding azotemia, like the fluid resuscitation uh, overnight, their BUN and creatinine go back to normal, that's something that you should say, that sounds more like Addison's to me than an acute or a chronic renal failure patient. So rapidly resolving azotemia with fluid therapy especially in a young to middle-aged dog, would make me think about uh, Addison's. Eosinophilia this is ba- and lymphocytosis are basically the lack of a stress response. So stress-induced changes in a CBC tend to be eosinopenia, lymphopenia. Lack of cortisol can result in eosinophilia and lymphocytosis, but as you can see, it's not present in very many animals. So the hemogram is really not very helpful. And hypercalcemia is a uniquely dog thing. So dogs have uh, up to 25% of dogs with Addison's disease, uh, whether it's mineralocorticoid or glucocorticoid uh, by itself, uh, can be hypercalcemic. Has to do primarily with the effects of glucocorticoids on renal excretion of calcium. But again, a young uh, to middle-aged dog with azotemia and hypercalcemia uh, would make me really think about uh, stimming that dog sooner rather than later. Because the other differentials for hypercalcemia in a young to middle-aged azotemic dog are all bad. So I would start definitely uh, by stimming that dog. And I'll tell you, one of the, the, the things that um, hammered that down for me is I was referred a dog. It was a four-year-old golden retriever. Um, had gone to their vet, um, their vet um, for vomiting, diarrhea, and being lethargic. The vet did blood work. The dog had a mild hyponatremia had a creatinine of five and a half, had a BUN of about 110, had a calcium of 16. And the the referring vet um, said, you know, this is not good. We need to refer you someplace that has 24-hour care and can do all this stuff. And the owner said, well, what do you think's wrong with my dog, you know, before I get too involved in this? And they said, well, I don't know, but I'd be worried about lymphoma. It's a golden retriever. It's hypercalcemic, blah, 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 blah. Uh, It's probably not a great thing. So the vet put it on fluids overnight um, because the owner couldn't come until the next day. And the following morning, the azotemia had completely resolved. Uh, The calcium was still high, um, but it wasn't as high as it was. The dog looked bright and alert and was doing great. And they sent the dog down. And I looked at the dog and I said, you know, I don't think your dog has lymphoma. I think your, your dog probably has Addison's disease. And we stemmed the dog and it was Addisonian. And the good thing about that story was that was Steve Martin's dog. And Steve Martin came in. This, he's the world's nicest human being. We see a lot of celebrities. Bar, by far, he's the nicest human being on the face of the planet. He came in, literally was crying in the exam room, saying, oh, my God, my dog's not dying of cancer. I said, well, let me get the test back, but I'm hoping your dog's not dying of cancer. His dog had Addison's, lived for like nine more years. But he would come into the hospital and still comes into the hospital, walk around to ICU, just you know, like with a baseball hat on and a, um, like a zippered up jacket. He looks like a homeless guy. He's six five, by the way. He's hard to ignore. And he's walking around the treatment room and he'll listen to people talking about their dogs or cats and how messed up they are. And on the way down, he'll stop at the business office and say, I just listened to so-and-so talking about how they can't afford their bill. Just send it to me. But don't tell them. Don't tell them who I am and what I did. And he does this like on a monthly basis. He's just a crazy nice guy. They're not all jerks, I've discovered. Now, we do have a lot of jerks who are celebrities, and I'll be happy to share that conversation with you, <laughs> but, but we're not going to have that conversation when I'm wired to a microphone. Where we really start to think about Addison's is when we look at the electrolytes, and the classic Addisonian is the hyponatremic, hyperkalemic. And again, if you look at the percentages, um, you know, 67 to 96%, 
54 to 80%. Why aren't they all 100%, uh, even in the face of aldosterone uh, insufficiency? Primarily because of what kind of fluid losses they've been having. So if, they get, if they've lost so much fluid in vomiting and diarrhea, they're going to have all kinds of electrolyte shifts and water shifts. Um, so the absence of that doesn't rule it out. And certainly normal electrolytes um, is an index of suspicion that maybe they have an isolated glucocorticoid insufficiency. Looking at the sodium-potassium ratio to diagnose, it really depends on where you want to put the number. You know, if you put it at less than 27, then it's really high. However, lots of diseases will cause that ratio abnormality. So third space fluid loss into the abdomen, uh, into the chest, excessive fluid loss outside the body, uh, whipworm infestation, all of those things can cause sodium-potassium ratios and have nothing to do with Addison's. And then urine-specific gravity less than 1030 in an animal that's dehydrated and azotemic. Again, that just has to do with the fact, uh, with the fact um, that they have a hard time concentrating their urine. Again, normal electrolytes um, with isolated ACTH deficiency from the pituitary. Early stage disease, we think that probably there's a percentage of dogs that we see who initially get diagnosed with isolated glucocorticoid that over the period of the next three to nine months develop full-blown Addison's, so they lose aldosterone production, and rarely due to destruction of the vesiculata or reticularis alone. It's been described in humans, but um, as far as we know, it hasn't really occurred uh, in a dog or a cat. Now, the classic full-blown Addisonian dog is a young or middle-aged female. The classic atypical isolated glucocorticoid insufficiency dog is older. So these tend to be older dogs and the full-blown Addisonian dogs. Their histories are a little bit different. They tend to be sicker for a longer period of time, and their signs are progressive. They don't tend to really wax and wane that much. They tend to just slowly get worse and worse and worse. More of these dogs are anemic than the full-blown Addisonian dogs, probably, again, reflecting the anemia of chronic disease. But there are a couple of case reports of severe GI bleeding, again, uh, just with isolated glucocorticoid insufficiency. And the thing that also separates out the glucocorticoid alone from full-blown Addisonian dogs is that these dogs tend to be hypoalbuminemic and hypocholesterolemic. And this probably is reflecting the effects on uh, GI permeability, resulting in uh, loss of protein uh, through the GI tract, and also effects on liver uh, function. So it looks like cortisol does have some effect on cortisol metabolism, at least with respect to the liver and the synthesis of cholesterol. So all of those things, older dogs, normal lights, chronic progressive symptoms, low-grade anemia, hypoalbuminemia, and hypocholesterolemia, I would think about uh, isolated glucocorticoid insufficiency. And probably before investigating with ultrasound and endoscopy and things like that, I'd probably just stim those dogs. It's way easier to stim than it is to figure the diagnosis out uh, later down the road. Now, sex predisposition for full-blown Addison's is female. And that's because all autoimmune endocrine disorders in people and endocrine disorders in dogs that are autoimmune in nature are female. So uh, in dogs, Addison's, diabetes, hypothyroidism, hypoparathyroidism, all way more common in females than in males. Same thing in humans. We don't think that this necessarily has anything to do with sex steroids uh, because most of these animals are spayed or neutered. So what's probably happening is that whatever the gene is, that's controlling the autoimmune process probably has something to do with the sex chromosome. So one of the ways that people are trying to isolate the gene or genes involved with Addison's is to focus on the sex chromosome. Average age for full-blown Addison's, again, is they're younger dogs, uh, four to five years of age. Dogs that are at low risk if they're under the age of four uh, and at low risk, again, if they're over the age of 10. So if you have an 11-year-old dog with azotemia and electrolyte abnormalities, I'd be betting that it's something else, uh, probably not Addison's, versus a four-year-old dog with azotemia and electrolyte abnormalities, chances, and, and if that dog's female, uh, probably would be betting and putting money first on Addison's uh, before investigating other things. Where things get all interesting is in breeds. If you, the first breed predisposition that we knew about were standard poodles, and that came out of a paper out of AMC, which then um, has been seen also in uh, Boston, Philadelphia, and California, where standard poodles, whether they're black or white, 
have, uh, and these are odds ratios. So what this means is an odds ratio of 2.6 means that the Airedale Terrier is 2.6 times more likely than a non-Airedale Terrier to develop Addison's. And so when you look at these breed ratios for different breeds, what you find is a couple of things that are interesting. One is Great Danes actually have a very high incidence of Addison's disease. And one of the things that's also interesting with Great Danes is that they have an increased risk for hypothyroidism as well. Um, and this is probably related to the same defect. Again, whatever's causing the autoimmune reaction is probably affecting uh, multiple organs. Other papers have looked at similar breed ratios and looking at different dogs. Um, the breed that's number one on the face of the planet uh, is the Portuguese water dog. Basically, just assume they're all Addisonian um, until somebody figures out they should quit breeding Portuguese water dogs. Um, as you probably know, when uh, President Obama decided he was going to get a dog, there was all this uproar. He was going to get a, go to the pound and get a dog. Well, that didn't happen. They got a purebred dog. They got a frickin' Portuguese water dog. So as soon as he got the Portuguese water dog, we sent him a box of DOCP. <laughs> said, you know, give this to your vet, uh, who I think ends up being the, the Army uh, veterinarians. You know, I wrote him a nice letter and said, yeah, this is not a good plan. Um, here's some ACTH and here's a bottle of DOCP because that dog is going to get it. Uh, and it's a female dog, so what the hell. Uh, and Westies, so West Highland Whites were also identified. So when we look at these breed predispositions, what it tells me is that if one of these breeds walks in with any of those symptoms that are remotely similar to Addison's, we just need to stim them. And a lot of the breed clubs know this. Um, and they'll tell people who are purchasing puppies, they'll be very concerned about, you know, have you had Addison's in this line of dogs? And anytime your dog gets sick, uh, stim it. We have standard poodle breeders who want us to stim their dogs every year, which is like insanity. Um, I mean, I don't think it's going to be very helpful. I, I'm happy to take their money and do the test. But what we're really looking for is a test, uh, once we identify where the gene is, that we can do gene-based testing of the parents and of the puppies when they're born and say, yeah, your dog is either going to get or not get this particular disease. How do we diagnose it? Well, there's really two ways to diagnose full-blown uh, or atypical. Uh, one is, is that um, there was a paper that came out looking at resting cortisol levels. So, for instance, if you have a dog with compatible clinical signs or they're kind of vague and you're not 100% sure, just do a resting cortisol. And what that paper showed was that if the resting cortisol was greater than 2.5, you weren't going to find an Addisonian dog by doing an ACTH stem test. So the advantage of that is you can uh, just send it into the lab when you send in your chem panel. Um, the disadvantage is, is that if it comes back less than 2.5, then you've lost a day. Um, then you're going to have to stem that dog and submit uh, the stem test to the lab. Um, the classic response, of course, to an, with Addison's is a pre-cortisol that's very low and a post-cortisol that's very low. Um, and most dogs with full-blown Addison's, that's what you're going to get. We're going to send you back a result that says uh, the pre and the post are both less than one. We actually can't find cortisol in there. If we're interested in looking at is it primary or secondary, the way that we diagnose that is by measuring endogenous ACTH. But that really has to happen on day one. Uh, because as soon as we put them on glucocorticoid supplementation, we can't run that test anymore because the glucocorticoids we're giving them are going to suppress their ACTH level. So if you have a breed that is commonly associated with glucocorticoid insufficiency or a breeder or a, a dog that's a dwarf and you're trying to figure out does he have um, primary pituitary dependent disease, then I would measure ACTH at the same time you're pulling the blood um, to do the ACTH stimulation test. So when we do the test, we're taking a baseline. We're either using the Cortricin IV or IM. Uh, again, it doesn't matter. Um, and for most dogs, the pre and the post, again, are going to be less than one. Less than five is considered uh, a subnormal response. Um, but honestly, if I had a dog that stemmed from four to five, I would be really concerned that he doesn't have Addison's and he's on a glucocorticoid and there's something else wrong with him. Uh, that's causing that stem test to be flat. Because again, most of these guys are just insanely low. Now the treatment for Addison's really gets divided into two phases. One is the acute emergency treatment of the full-blown Addisonian crisis, which is fun and entertaining. And then there's the maintenance form of the disease, which is not that fun or entertaining. Um, and most owners don't like that part because it, it becomes expensive. And so this is one of the diseases where at some point, especially in a large breed dog, 
uh, you need to let them know, look, you know, we're going to, hopefully your dog has Addison's. That would be the great news. The bad news with your Great Dane with Addison's is this is not a cheap disease. And it's going to be something they have to take medication for. And they're going to have to take it uh, for the rest of their life. So for the Addisonian crisis dog, these dogs usually present with signs of hypovolemia, hypotension, shock, and the electrolyte abnormalities. Um, so they'll present with acute collapse. Um, they'll be bradyarrhythmic, bradycardic if they're hyperkalemic. Um, they can also develop ventricular arrhythmias and ventricular fibrillation if the hyperkalemia is uh, present for a long time. And they'll often uh, present with uh, hypotension, like I said, hypovolemic shock. Lots and lots and lots of studies in experimentally induced Addisonian dogs, which were done, fortunately, a long time ago, uh, as well as in Addisonian-induced rats, adrenalectomized rats, show that e if you don't do anything else, as long as you give them fluids, they'll survive an Addisonian crisis. It's all fluid. You know, giving them steroids, giving them mineralocorticoid replacement, that's all good, and they need to get those things at some point. But the thing that corrects everything else is fluids. Fluids restore blood pressure, they restore blood volume, they dilute the potassium, they promote potassium excretion, they'll bring the sodium concentration back up. It's basically fluids um, that will save their life. So if you have an emergent, uh, what you think is an Addisonian crisis dog, we're going to go ahead, you're going to pull blood uh, for your chemistries, uh, your electrolytes, take the first sample as well for your pre-cortisol ACTH stem test. We're going to give them uh, saline at 60 to 80 mils per kilogram per hour for one to two hours. Then depending on their parameters, their heart rate uh, and their blood pressure, then decide if we can start to lower that. Um, occasionally we'll have to give head of starch uh, as well to regulate uh, blood pressure and blood volume if the saline loading by itself isn't working. About 5% of the patients, 10% of the patients will be hypoglycemic on presentation. So those animals are gonna get a bolus of dextrose and then we're gonna put them on uh, two and a half to five percent dextrose. You're going to go ahead and do your ACTH stem test uh, while you're fluid resuscitating them. And then there's lots of arguments about do they need to receive glucocorticoids in the immediate period. Uh, the answer is yeah, they probably need a glucocorticoid to feel better. They don't need a glucocorticoid to live, but they need a glucocorticoid to feel better. And there's a variety of different steroids and dosing uh, that you can use. Um, dexamethasone, sodium phosphate, just regular dexamethasone. One's a little bit faster acting than the other. Uh, you can use prednisolone, uh, sodium succinate as well. The only thing with that is that prednisone cross reacts with uh, cortisol on the ACTH stem test. So if you're using a steroid and you're stemming them, either stem them first, or if you're going to give a steroid at the same time, use dexamethasone. Uh, don't use prednisolone. If they're severely acidotic on presentation, our criticalists, everybody's a little bit different. They like to fluid resuscitate them first um, and see if they need to get bicarb. If the acidosis persists after adequate fluid resuscitation, then they'll go ahead and start to give bicarb. Um, and then we'll go ahead and start mineralocorticoid replacement. Now, what I usually tell people, what we usually do, is that I, what I would tell you is if you're in doubt about the diagnosis, you're not, you think it's Addisonian, you've got a test, it'll be back tomorrow, the dog's got all the classic signs of Addison's. I would just give him DOCP and not worry about it. Because if he's Addisonian, you made the right decision. If he's not Addisonian, you haven't hurt him. You will not hurt an animal giving uh, DOCP. There's nice papers in normal beagles where they got DOCP once a day for a month. Uh, didn't phase him. So the kidney's way smarter. Um, it'll figure it out. If he doesn't need the mineralocorticoid, it'll, it'll deal with it. So... When in doubt, go ahead and treat for Addison's, wait for the test to come back, uh, and the next day you can either tell an owner, good news, he's not Addisonian, or good news, he is Addisonian. You're going to win no matter what. Um, so go ahead and just give it, um, and then you'll be a step ahead of the game. We tend to not use uh, Florinaf in the acute situation because they're sick and they're probably not going to absorb it. Mm -hmm. And after stabilizing the bed, you talk to the owner about doing the cortisol levels or the ACTH stem test. But you have given them, uh, say, DEX-SP. How long do you have to wait to do the cortisol levels or the ACTH stem test? If it's DEX-SP, you don't have to wait. Because really what you're looking for, with a single dose of dexamethasone, you're not going to cause adrenal atrophy. 
Um, so what you're going to get is if it's less than one and less than one, that's the reality. If you gave a normal healthy dog that, his resting cortisol might be a little bit low, but he's going to stim just fine. Because it won't affect it. And DOCP won't affect it either. So DOCP doesn't affect it. So it won't affect your stim test um, at all. So yeah, you want to blast him right away. The other thing that happens is that we'll have some veterinarians call us and we'll have owners come back in. They've had a dog that's been Addisonian for a while on treatment, and they'll come in and say, well, I want to get an ACTH stem test to see if my dog still has Addison's. It doesn't go away. you know. And, and I don't know where that comes from. I don't know if they've been to Uncle Billy Bob's website or whatever. But if the dog had a flat ACTH stem and responded, the adrenals are dead. They're, they're never going to come back. So we don't have to measure cortisol. Sometimes I think they get confused because they think in doing a stem test or measuring cortisol, they're measuring the prednisone supplementation. That, that doesn't work either. So once they're Addisonian, the other good news for the owner is, hey, we don't have to run any more of these ACTH stem tests. This is a one-time thing for you. Maintenance therapy then, once you get them fl- uh, through the acute phase and they're volume resuscitated, they're stable, their electrolytes are normal, then we're going to put them on uh, long-term chronic uh, mineralocorticoid replacement. And it's very interesting because um, prior to 1960, the only form of mineralocorticoid replacement therapy uh, was DOCP. Uh, so humans with Addison's would have to take an injection, an intramuscular injection of DOCP once a month uh, in order to regulate their Addison's. And at about the late 1950s, early 1960s, there was a company trying to get through the FDA a oral mineralocorticoid replacement so that people wouldn't have to go take these shots, which apparently don't, it, it hurts to take the shot. And it really wasn't going very well for this drug company. And I think this mainly has to do with our friends in Rockville, Maryland, who regulate these sorts of things. But what really helps get your drug pushed through the FDA is that if you're the president of the United States and you suffer from that particular disease. So Kennedy was an Addisonian, did not like getting injections in his ass once every 30 days, found out about this trial going on with Florinef and said, hmm, why is this drug not approved? And they said, yeah, excellent question, Mr. President. Boom, Florinef on the market. And Florinef came out on the market and DOCP sort of went away uh, because people didn't want to give themselves injections. DOCPs come back primarily on the veterinary side for two main reasons. One is owner compliance is way better um, if they're just having to do a shot once a month. And if you look at the papers that evaluate the efficacy of Florinef or DOCP to manage the electrolyte abnormalities, not necessarily clinical signs, but just the electrolyte abnormalities, DOCP wins every time. So typically what we see with Florinef is that we dose Florinef to normalize the potassium, but a lot of dogs, you'll probably notice on Florinef that when we get their potassium normal, their sodiums are still a little bit low. And if you raise the Florinef to the point where you're making the sodium normal as well, a lot of those dogs become PUPD. And PUPD is actually a very common uh, side effect of Addisonian treatment. And it's either related to, in the case of Florinef, too much Florinef, or in the case of DOCP, too much glucocorticoid. And so we, if we're using Florinef, we'll dose Florinef to regulate potassium and ignore mild hyponatremia. I don't uh, have owners supplement with salt because what all that really does is make them PUPD. So being mildly hyponatremic is not an issue. Uh, certainly being hyperkalemic uh, is an issue. Um, the other thing with Florinef versus DOCP, depending on the size of the dog, eventually it'll become cheaper uh, to use DOCP, depending on what you're paying uh, and what you're charging, because Florinef itself is not an inexpensive drug. The thing to remember, too, the diff- main difference between the two is that Florinef has glucocorticoid uh, activity. So many dogs will do fine on Florinef alone. They don't necessarily have to take a supplemental glucocorticoid. So what we usually do is if they're on Florinef is I have the owners keep prednisone tablets at home. And if they're having an episode with the dog where he becomes lethargic and isn't wanting to eat, I'll have them go ahead and supplement the dog with pred. If they think that, we're, or if we're going <clears> to <throat> do something stressful to the dog, like it's going to go to a boarding facility, it's going to undergo general anesthesia for something elective like a dental or an elective surgery, during those times of stress, we will supplement them with the glucocorticoid. And then once that stressful event is over, then we'll try and wean them off the glucocorticoid. Uh, 
With DOCP, DOCP has no glucocorticoid-like activity, so you're pretty much committed that they're going to have to take uh, some dose of prednisone or cortisone, something to replace uh, glucocorticoid. And again, we're going to adjust that level of glucocorticoid depending on uh, what level of stress is going on with that dog. Yeah, usually the day before. Like if they're coming in tomorrow for a dental, I'll have the owner start pre- If they're not on PRED, I'll have them start it the night before. If they're on PRED, I'll have them at least double it uh, the night before. And then the morning of, we'll double the dose again. And again, all of the studies show that pa- Addisonian dogs under anesthesia, the thing that fixes them is not the PRED dose, not the mineralocorticoid dose, it's being on fluids. So as long as they're on adequate fluid therapy during the anesthetic episode, they should be fine. Um, but I would up their glucocorticoids because once they wake up from the anesthesia, if they didn't eat in the morning, they may not eat the night after that procedure. That can be a stressor and make them feel crappy, so I would give them prednisone for a couple of days. So the main thing with, with the Addisonian, especially the, the crisis Addisonian, is that saline fixes most of your problems, even if you don't do anything else. Um, most Addisonian dogs have a full recovery within 24 hours. They look like they've risen from the dead. If they don't look like they've risen from the dead, then there's something wrong. Um, either they're not Addisonian or they are Addisonian, and now they've actually gone into renal failure. Um, there's something else we need to correct. Um, dexamethasone, not an issue uh, with affecting ACTH stem tests. Um, it won't affect um, the measurement of cortisols at all, but prednisone will. And then again, whether you're using uh, fludrocortisone or uh, DOCP, let's just take a vote. How many people, if they had a newly diagnosed Addisonian, how many would put them on DOCP? How many would put them on Florinaf? Yeah, so most of the people. How many people let the owners give DOCP at home? And do you give it to them IM or sub-Q at home? Yeah, so it works either way. So I am or sub-Q, nice paper, equal efficacy. So I think for a lot of owners, it's easier to give a sub-Q injection. Um, what we usually do is that um, we'll give them DOCP in the hospital during their crisis. We'll have them come back in at 21 days and every three to four days thereafter until they need their next one. When they come in for the next injection, we show the owner how to do it. We watch them give it, and then we'll send them home uh, with a vial. Um, so we, we tend to only check, not only, but we tend to want to check their electrolytes about every two to three months. And if they're stable, then we'll, do, we'll push it back um, you know, to every four months or every five months, depending on uh, the level of intelligence of the person at the other end, which sometimes is questionable. Um, again, with DOCP, the average is 25, but we have dogs who take it every two weeks. We have dogs who take it every three months. I mean, I don't, there's a lot of variation, I think, in what the dose is. And we have some owners who want us to keep pushing that further and further and further um, because they want to get away with the, the least amount of DOCP that they have to use. And I think that that's okay. It's just that in the beginning, though, they're going to spend a lot of money because they're going to be doing a lot of electrolyte checks. And then we have other people who say, look, is it harmful to give it more than every 30 days because my brain doesn't work that well? I'm just always going to give it on the first of the month. And that's fine. Um, it's, again, it's really hard to overdose uh, an animal with, with DOCP. The other thing that we recommend doing is that the label dose, the, you know, the milligram per pound, is that if you have a giant breed of dog, I'd start with half. Um, because it really looks like the really big dogs. If you look at what uh, aldosterone's doing, it's probably a drug that's better dosed on surface area than weight in kilograms because it's more of a metabolic effect. So really big dogs will start at half of that dose and then only take them up uh, to higher doses if we have to. And that definitely cuts down on the expense. And then the last thing we'll do with these dogs is that for the dogs, like I said, who are developing PUPD on DOCP and glucocorticoid, you know, try and get the prednisone down to the lowest possible dose. And there is no way to regulate it with a blood test. It's all symptoms. So is he eating? Is he active? Does he not, are his stools normal? Is he not vomiting? If the GI signs and his appetite are controlled, that's his dose, and I would try and keep working him down to the lowest dose that allows him to be happy um, and is making him PUPD. You can go every other day in some dogs, uh, and the other thing we've done with some dogs is go from prednisone to cortisone acetate orally um, because it looks like some dogs have less PUPD on cortisone uh, than they do on prednisone. It'd be the same milligram per kilogram dose, but it seems like um, it has less effect on uh, antidiuretic hormone. 
Mm -hmm. I haven't used Triumph Sin Loan to manage an Addisonian, but it would make sense. I mean, again, you're, the only thing you're doing with those with the steroid is to get rid of symptoms, and so if you can control it with with that, I think that'd be fine. I'd probably want it to be shorter acting than Triumph Sin Loan, but if it works, then that's fine. In cats, we've sometimes given them, you know, for the nasty cats, we'll give them DOCP and then, you know, give them depo if that's the only thing that'll control it. But we try to get the owners not to do that. Unless you don't like the cat, in which case I think depo is a really good drug uh, for cats that you don't like, give it to them often. All right, does anybody have any questions about uh, Addison's, either traditional or isolated glucocorticoid or anything? Yes. If, yeah, if you're going to go, f- yeah, if I had a dog that was on Flornaf and I wanted to start him on DOCP, I would give him a dose of DOCP and keep him on the Flornaf for two more days, and then I'd stop it. Um, and if you're going the other way, I would just start the Flornaf at whatever day you're into the DOCP cycle and just let it wear off. Because again, they, the dog can deal with too much mineralocorticoid, they just can't deal with too little. Yeah. To Addison's, not that anyone has reported. I think because the number of cases is so small, um, but yeah, there hasn't been a breed predisposition reported in cats. All right, have a good evening.